Welcome to the Tampa Bay Times Virtual Festival of Reading. You can see all of our author interviews and panels at festivalofreading.com. I'm Colette Bancroft, the book editor at the Tampa Bay Times, and I am very happy to be here today talking to James W. Hall. He is the author of 21 novels, four books of poetry, two short story collections, and two works of nonfiction, including Hit Lit, a study of 12 of the biggest bestsellers of the 20th century. His new book, Bad Axe, is the 15th novel in the Thorn series. The first, Under Cover of Daylight, was published in 1987. Formerly a professor of creative writing at Florida International University in Miami, where he taught for 40 years, he now lives with his wife, Evelyn, and two King Charles Spaniels in the mountains of North Carolina. Although I think that last number needs to be updated, right? That's correct. We're, we're up to three at the moment. Yeah. These are pandemic puppies. <laughs> they're adorable. I've seen them on Facebook. Thank you. Thank they're, you. Well, just, they're a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll bet. I'll bet. It's great to see you, Jim. I'm very you pleased. You too, Colette. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wish you were, I wish we were both uh, at USF St. Pete. Uh, back, you would be back in your old stomping ground since you were. I do too. Yeah, back. we, I have some happy memories uh, of that area with, and uh, that involved you as well. Yeah, but maybe we'll be able to do that again one of these years, but, uh, sure but hope so. This year, this is uh, this is a pretty good alternative for, um, for writers and readers to to connect. So, I'm glad you could join us. Um, I really enjoyed Bad Axe, um, and you had published uh, fourteen, uh, fi thirteen books about Thorn, or fourteen books about Thorn. Sorry, um, the last one, The Big Finish, was I think about six years ago. Published about six years ago. And then you wrote several books about a different character. You sort of left Thorn tying flies on, uh, you know, at, down in the Keys and switched to a different character. What, what made you come back to Thorn? Well, let me, let me answer it by saying what made me go away from <laughs> Thorn uh, first is that, I mean, I, I liked him. Um, I'd always sort of had a, um, um, not exactly a love-hate relationship, but I'd always felt a little cramped uh, by being, uh, by writing a series character. It wasn't my initial uh, um, intent when I first wrote, when I wrote Undercover of Daylight, that first one. Mm -hmm. But um, I was sort of cajoled and bullied by my editor and publisher uh, mm -hmm. into doing more Thorns because the book, that first one did better than they expected. Um, so I came back to him and he, um, he grew on me as the years went by. Um, and you know, the, one of the difficulties of doing a series is especially with a guy like Thorne, who is not a private investigator. He's not a cop. He's, uh, you know, he, he doesn't uh, have his feet up on the desk waiting for the next uh, beautiful babe to walk in and hand him a problem. Uh, he, he's uh, a loner and isolated and, um, and likes it that way. So, you know, I have to go to extreme measures to get him engaged mm -hmm. in the next uh, issue. And little by little over 14 books, um, I had managed to kill off virtually everyone he's ever come in contact with in order to propel him into the next, you know, the next story. And it was starting to uh, strain my credulity a little bit that a guy that was such a loner and so isolated and so antisocial uh, could be dragged into so many different adventures. So I needed to cool off a little bit. I, I thought maybe it was the end. That's why I called it the big finish. Right, uh, right. The 14th, I thought maybe that was the last one. And yeah. then, I had always been interested in, in a different in a different kind of book uh, that um, that I've been writing, more of an international uh, thriller, uh, Ludlum uh, yeah. kind of book, or or Daniel Silva, or some somebody something that roamed around the world that was really not Thorne, because Thorne is you know until this most recent book. Uh, Thorne has almost always been stuck in 
South Florida. So those two books uh, that, uh, that I did with uh, Harper McDaniel was her name, started yeah. out in Miami and then went to Africa and Europe and various places. And it really was fun. I, I really exercised some new muscles yeah. with that. And that was nice. I, I had a good time and they did, they did it pretty well. Um, but when it came time to do the next book after those two had run their course, um, I had an idea, I got an idea first, and then I was trying to match that idea up with the right kind of person to, mm-hmm. to take on this idea. And Thorne just seemed so easy and so natural. Um, just had, yeah. yeah. As, a, as a character to mm-hmm. handle these, the problem that I, that I had uh, kind of decided on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I was glad to see him back. Um, and nice. so I, I can see the dilemma of that, you know, that although he sometimes has responded to beautiful babes who brought him problems. No, that is true. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but he doesn't have a, you know, a sign on the door that says, you know, right. have beautiful babes that bring me their problems. So, you know, he, as you say, you always have to sort of construct a way to get him, you know, involved in a case. And because of his nature, yeah, I hadn't thought about it that though, but it's like the old joke about, you know, murder she wrote, you know, every, everyone that Carrie Jessica Fletcher knew, you know, got right. killed that there's yeah. by all, you know, if you th- thought about it mathematically, that little town she lived in should be empty. There's yeah, no well, that's, that's similar to Key Largo, you know, yeah. uh, uh, it wouldn't take long for that to get around in Key Largo. Oh my God, here comes Thorne, run for your life, you know. Somebody's going to die. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you, uh, I think everybody who reads series characters, and, and I read many that I love, that I go back to, and, you yeah. know, you just have to give, that's just the given of yeah. certain series characters. Except, you know, when, the, when it's, uh, say, in Michael Conley's case or uh, in John Sanford with Lucas Davenport, they're, they have, that's their job. Nice. So they, you know, they take it on. I've never really been that interested in, in police procedurals myself. So it kind of leads me to um, writing vigilante books is essentially mm-hmm. what, I, what I'm doing is somebody that sees an injustice that's being done and doesn't have confidence that justice will be done by the authorities unless he takes a hand in the whole thing. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I hadn't thought about it that way, but, but it's, you're right. Um, the, you said something a minute ago about the, this book starting not with, I think I'll go back to Thorne, but with a, a problem or an idea that you wanted to write about. And, and this book is in some ways sort of ripped from the headlines, you know, deals with current issues. And, and I'm assuming you were probably writing it a couple of years, started writing it at least a couple of years ago. Correct. Um, yeah. But they're not issues that have gone away in the interim. Um, so I wanted you, I wondered if you could talk about, um, about what that sort of spark was that, that led you to this book, to this book. Well, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. The, um, the initial um, thing, and you know, I knew I was sort of, I'd finished the, pre, the last book, and so I was sort of on the hunt for the next subject, and I didn't really have it at hand. Um, so my antenna were up, and I was listening more carefully to things that maybe I wouldn't have paid so much attention to otherwise. I, I was living, uh, Evelyn and I were living in a condo in Key Largo that we were renting during the winter. And the people that lived uh, next door to us, we got to be friendly with. And um, he, I asked one of the questions because we were about the same age, the guy and I. Uh, I asked one of the questions that people, baby boomers frequently ask other baby boomer men which is, what did you do during Vietnam? Because for me, Vietnam was sort of the 
kind of the moral watershed moment in my life, uh, deciding that I was not going to go into the military and that I was not going to do those things. And it was a great, great emotional and moral and um, personal struggle. So I, I'm always interested in what other people did. And I, so I asked this guy and he had been uh, in the Air Force. He had retired as an Air Force pilot. And he said, well, during Vietnam, I, I joined the Air Force to get out of having to go to Vietnam. So I wouldn't have to be on the ground. And I said, so where were you? And he said, oh, I was in a place called Johnston Atoll. And I, I didn't, I just let it pass. But then I went back in and, and uh, Googled Johnston Atoll and to see what it was, because he didn't really say anything about it. And it's, it just turned out to be this fascinating place with a fascinating history. And I said, oh, bingo, I think I could use this. Yeah. So I went back and, and kind of uh, interviewed my, my neighbor, who's a, who was a big reader. Uh, he loved the kind of books that I write. He'd read a bunch of my books. And so he was a perfect person to interview. He knew the kind of things that I wanted to know. Yeah. And it was full of great details. So, but I, the thing that I didn't realize at the time was um, that Johnson Atoll was the storage uh, center during the time when he was there for the, the entire uh, chemical warfare arsenal because it had just been, uh, uh, the, that had just been passed by some government body that we were no longer going to use chemical warfare. And so Johnson Atoll was chosen as a place that was so isolated, so out of the way that uh, it could store this, the VX gas, the sarin gas, the napalm, all this terrible, terrible stuff that we've been manufacturing with the idea that one day an incinerator would be built there and it would destroy all this stuff out in the middle of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to myself at the time, okay, what if, this is back during Vietnam, what if somebody who was a Vietnam age radical, you know, anti-war, SDS or under, you know, weather underground or some, somebody like that had stolen some of this volatile, dangerous material in order to use it and then didn't use it. And then it reemerged uh, in our own lifetime. Yeah. And so there were a lot of mechanical things to work out once I had that premise in mind, you know, can that stuff survive? Yeah. Uh, How long does it? Remain? Right. Is it, is it lethal for another 40 years? How did it get stored away and not used? Why did it come back now instead of later? And so on and so on. And that really, answering all those questions really got me excited about uh, solving that and figuring that out and having Thorne then be put in a position to solve those things too. Mm -hmm. um, to encounter the right. danger of this in the first place and so on. How to get him so, in it. Yeah. I, and I had, you know, you mentioned Rip from the headlines and, and it's true that there, it has some topical aspects to it. Uh, immigration, um, uh, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, although I had been interested in those two issues. And when I look back, I think I've been writing about immigration from really from the earliest books because in South Florida, immigration is the name of the game. I mean, immigration with the Cuban exiles and all the other various Latin American uh, people who have been dislocated and brought to Miami, that has been, you know, a very strong, powerful, fundamental issue in my backyard long before it was nationally. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been writing about that for a while and I've also been writing about bad guys who are loosely affiliated with each other, uh, not exactly white supremacists, but, but those kind of people. So in a way it was kind of returning to things that I'd already uh, cared about enough to want to write about them in some more detail. Yeah, yeah, knitting them into a new story. Um, this book starts with Thorne in Florida at home in this kind of 
you know, idyllic situation with a lovely new girlfriend and, you know, and he's kind of living the life and um, Sugarman shows up and, and I want to talk a little bit about him as a character too and sort of brings him this problem um, that uh, a, a character who sounds sort of like your neighbor, obviously, and he's, yes. he's yes. The, 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 the one who's been to Johnson A. Toll. The details on that were amazing. Now, I'm, in, I'm glad to know how you got all those details, because I was thinking, did he serve during Vietnam? And was he on that island? But, um, but anyway, uh, in short order, you take Thorn out of his native habitat. And you take him to two places that are really unlike Key Largo. You take him to Southern Arizona, where I lived for 10 years, so all that was very familiar to me, and, and to Michigan, to a little bitty town in Michigan, which gives the book its name. Um, I wonder if you can talk about that. As you say, he was, for a long time, he was sort of a Floridian, a native Floridian, and that was where he did what he does. But um, I know you took him to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And Monster. yeah. Um, and not the pretty side of North Carolina. No, no. The pig farms. The pig farm, yeah. Um, but this, I wonder if you could talk this about taking him to these, uh, these territories and uh, why you did it, and also how, how you researched that part of the book. Well, that, thanks. That's a, that's a fun question. Um, uh, number one, uh, I said uh, earlier about the international uh, novels, those uh, when they come for you mm -hmm. and when you can't stop, those, those two books, um, about flexing new muscles. And, and in a way, um, at this stage in my life and my career, that's what interests me is learning how to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, uh, I, I wanted to break the box in a way to break free of the, the box. So I, I knew um, that sending him into two strange locales uh, would be um, a challenge for me and a challenge for him, which I thought would be fun uh, mm -hmm. to do. And the, uh, I lived in uh, El Paso, Texas for a year and taught at University of Texas, El Paso and, and spent some time driving around that, the Southwest uh, and exploring. I, I never actually went down to Tucson and that area on the border, but from what I could research and, and see um, on Google Earth and the, all the various places that I researched, it wasn't that different. Uh, topographically and geographically. Oh, yeah, that, 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 that that from like West Texas to the Arizona border is very, you know, it, it, it's the same, uh, yeah. the same kind of uh, environment, yeah. And the, uh, yeah, the, the other experience I had about El Paso when I lived there, that was like 1980 or 81, is that um, there, it, the, the Rio Grande was right outside my uh, faculty office, and I would see people, Mexicans, coming across the border uh, to, to work in El Paso, or, or who knows what. And then late in the afternoon, they'd be crossing the Rio Grande to go back to their homes in, in Juarez. And um, that always struck me as being a kind of a beautiful thing. You know, that the border, that having a border that was open, that people uh, in some ways respected the border, mm -hmm. but could uh, navigate it in a way that made sense. Right. It seemed healthy and, uh, and it also created great Mexican food in El Paso oh. as they brought it across with for, the, for us. Anyway, so those things were in my mind. Um, and I, I, I knew at some stage that I wanted to write about the, the current, that current aspect of immigration of people who are struggling and willing to risk their lives and come a thousand miles uh, and to, to take what chances they have to take in order to have a better life. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
and that, that there are, I knew when I was living in El Paso, I knew a guy who used to uh, be a member of a group that would go out and drive along the border at night and harass and, and uh, pretend to be a cop, mm -hmm. uh, harass people crossing the border. Yes. That was his sort of his hobby and the hobby of all these other people. It always struck me as being incredibly inhumane and, and ugly. And so that was in the back of my mind too, is, is that mindset. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if that felt like a natural place, I had never been to, I've been to Detroit once to visit, uh, I went to Elmer Leonard's funeral. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I had seen some of Michigan and drove around a little bit when I was up there. Um, but I've never been to Bad Axe. Mm -hmm. However, also in this condo uh, wh where I met the guy from Johnston Atoll, there was a couple that I got to be friendly with who were from Bad Axe, Michigan. And um, I, I used to see the little Bad Axe uh, sticker on the back of their car from the car dealership. And I'd walk by every day as I'm walking the dogs and think, Bad X, I really love that title, you know. Um, it's a great, it's a great title. Well, it, because it's yeah, yeah, it's like a pun, it's like two puns in one, you know. Uh, and I'm always looking for a title that I can put on a hat that I can wear on the tennis court that, <laughs> that has some appropriate thing to it. Like dead last is one of my hats. You know, that works as a tennis hat, and bad X also I think works pretty well as my tennis hat. So anyway, I, I knew I wanted Bad X to figure out it just to be able to use that as a title. I didn't know how yeah. I would make it work, but mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's the capricious way my mind works is, that, okay, now I have to figure out how they get to Michigan and why, yeah. you know, yeah. why does the book go there? Uh -huh. How do they get from Arizona to Michigan? And, but yeah, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. Uh, boy, you moved into the right condo building, I guess. I'm telling you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sadly, we can't go back this year because of the COVID thing and living, <clears throat> paying a lot of money to stay inside and not doing anything mm -hmm. and, and yeah. being in close proximity to a lot of other people is mm -hmm. not that appealing this year, right. sadly. But. Right. So you're wintering in North Carolina this year. Yeah, yeah. Got some good long underwear and ready to go. <laughs> well, you have those lap dogs too. They're good for keeping. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think that I think that breed was actually maybe you know selected for their lap. Oh yeah, quality. King Charles. That was his. He chose them. That was their job was to yep. sit in his lap. They're good at that. Yes, they are. Um, you you published this book after work, you know, having published through traditional publishers for a long time. This time you did the book yourself, right? You published the book yourself. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about that experience, how it was different, what you, you know, why you- Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, I mean, I've been to the mountaintop. I had, um, Sonny Mehta was my editor for yeah. one book. I'd been with Norton for two novels and uh, you know I'd had I'd had a the limousine treatment in New York and and it was great while it lasted and and there was that was a time in publishing uh, where the, the all the publishers seemed to be flush with cash and they were bringing in new writers and promoting them really well and but that has sort of fallen off, mm -hmm. uh, and partly with the rise of ebooks and Amazon. Um, and what what kind of gave me courage to do this was those two books that you mentioned, the international books, were both with Amazon mm -hmm. uh, Publishing, Thomas and Mercer. Um, and so I got a glimpse of what how Amazon works uh, and what they can prov provide on author, which is quite remarkable. Uh, yeah. The, the uh, information that they provide, the access to uh, all kinds of cool stuff. You know, how, how is your book selling? 
um, and where exactly is it selling. Um, uh, you know, if you highlight, if you really like a passage in, in a book, you can highlight it. I have access to uh, 20 of the most frequently highlighted passages in any of my books. You think, wow, how cool is that? You know, uh, that I can see what people like, the kind of writing, the kind of language. Anyway, so that, that all kind of um, was part of my education to do it myself. Um, and then, you know, I, a lot of my friends um, have walked away from traditional publishers. My good friend, Larry Shames, mm -hmm. who writes about Key West, and he, he did it about two or three years ago, two or three novels ago. Paula Vine has done some of that. Another friend of mine writes legal thrillers set in South Florida. Um, and the, the idea that you control uh, things, uh, I can control the price. I could right now on my computer, uh, lower the price or raise the price. And uh, so the mathematics of it are really fa fascinating and wonderful. Um, and plus the royalties that I make on it are 70%. Um, mm -hmm. Now think, of, think about that. That's, I can sell a book for $3 uh, and make $2.10 yeah. on that book. Mm -hmm. When I was publishing traditionally, sell a book for $20, 10% royalty, uh, or yeah, 10% royalty, that's $2 for a $20 book. Yeah. So I'm making more on a $3 book, or I can change it to $4, you know, it's, it's stuff like that. Right. Just sort of, I thought that would be fun, like a new thing to learn about. I mean, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, when we were talking, one of the things that I'm interested in in this phase of my career is learning how to do new stuff. Um, um, the book business is, it's tried to stay up with the modern world, but mm -hmm. I mean, it's still uh, about a hundred years behind. They don't know, you know, they don't know who buys the books. Yeah. They're sold at a bookstore. They don't know who bought that book. They, they can't tell me what the gender breakdown of my readers is. Amazon can tell me that. They can't tell me the age group. Amazon can tell me that. Mm -hmm. uh, my, where I'm selling geographically around the world, around the United States. It's, I, just, I just like the book business. And I thought this would be a way to stick my finger in a little nook and cranny over here that... Uh, yeah that I didn't know that much about. Plus, I own that book forever. Yeah. Uh, that's my book. And I'll, I'll make, you know, as long as I'm alive, as long as that book survives, uh, and it will survive as long as there's an internet, um, it's still available. Right. Where a publisher can say, no, it's, we're mm -hmm. remaindering it, it's gone, Perfect. forget it. Mm -hmm. Can't find it anymore. Right. Um, so there were lots of reasons, but okay. I've learned a lot and I'm, I'm really kind of high on this uh, yeah, it sounds new like world. It. Yeah, it's changed so, so much in such a short period of time. You know, I mean, I've, I've written stories about self-publishing and, and how, you know, how it works and it's hard to even keep up with the subject because yeah. it's changed so rapidly. But I think you're right that traditional publishers have, have, have and continue to struggle with you know. Yeah, well, they, I, I thought we, Evelyn and I were watching this happen um, when the, when ebooks first started to appear. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, the earliest, uh, the Nooks and the Kindles first started to appear. And that was some 10, 12, I don't know how many years ago. And the publishers just sort of, because uh, I've talked to them about this, it seemed, wow, this is great. Because, you know, with a Kindle, uh, I can, uh, as a writer, I can uh, go on in my book that I own, that I bought, it's in my hand, and I can search for uh, a word or a phrase or anything I want to find in that book, and I go right there. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that's a, an important function. 
and I was talking to write book reviews. It's a great function. Yes, I'm, I know. That's that's what I mean. You know, are there all these unanticipated benefits to ebooks that they didn't recognize that they just sort of laughed off and sloughed off? And I think they really made a, a big strategic. The traditional publishers made a big strategic mistake by not getting full bore into this new world. They're catching. They're trying. They're catching up, and they're they're trying. Yeah. 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 But those first. The, my first six novels mm -hmm. um, in the 80s did in the contracts, they did not even mention ebooks because right. they didn't exist. They didn't anticipate them. So those books are, you know, they, they don't own those books. I own the ebook rights to those early books, which I put on Amazon myself. Another thing that I can do that, and I can control them in a way that, uh, that sadly, the later books that they do control, they charge so much money for them that nobody buys them mm -hmm. uh, as ebooks. You know, yeah. people buy ebooks because they're cheap, uh, yeah. three or four dollars. Um, and I know that's, you know, that has a double edged sword to yeah. cheap books. However, I, the world, the way the world works now is, um, People understand, readers understand that if they can get a pretty good book for four or five dollars, that's mm -hmm. where they're going to go instead of twenty dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think it's interesting. It sounds like you're going to stick with it. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure, really. I, you know, I got this um, this uh, deal a couple of years ago with uh, Netflix. Uh, for the for the Thorn series, oh. uh, and they're trying to do the Thorn series. If they did that, yeah. you know, if it came to the to TV, uh, then it would change the dynamics. Then they probably would offer me in the traditional publishing so much money up front because there was the movie connection that mm -hmm. I might be enticed to go back. But yeah. I don't even know if that that's true. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, those things can take a long time to happen. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and not pan out at all. Right, the thorn. Some of the thorn books have been optioned before, haven't they? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> they all, they all have. I've, I've made some money over the years on those, and had some sort of near misses with them, and and learned a lot. I've gone to Hollywood, writ, written scripts, and right. those kind of things, and it's fun. It's interesting, but um, it's sort of. Uh, a cotton candy, you know, it's not, it's not real. Yeah, you know? believe it when you see it. Yeah. Oh yeah, cash the check and <laughs> just figure yeah. if it cashes, if it clears, that's enough, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and well, although I hope they do make a Thorn series because it would be, I mean, he'd be a great character and the settings, you know. Well, they, they sort of did it already with Bloodlines. I mean, yeah, Bloodlines it, yeah. Awfully damn close, a little yeah. too close. Uh -huh. uh, in some ways, but hey, I was I was happy to see the keys show up so well on yeah. TV. Yeah, when they can make Thorn. They can advertise it by saying, "If you love Bloodlines, that's that's the right approach." Thank you, Colette. We'll <laughs> pass that on. <laughs> um, do you th do you think you'll go back at ever to Harper to that character? Um, and to those, well, those you know, they didn't. That was an Amazon deal, mm -hmm. and uh, they bought two books, and I gave them two books. And um, I'll tell you, those were the hardest books I've ever had to write because uh, I have lived abroad. I lived in Spain for a year, uh, uh, Fulbright, many years ago, and I traveled all over. Uh, and I have since then. I've traveled in. Europe and various places. So I had some familiarity, but I had to do an enormous amount of research mm -hmm. to write those books. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Different than anything that I've ever had to do before. And I'm not sure it's a cost-effective way mm -hmm. to spend my time at this stage of my life. Um, it's, it's much easier to write from uh, more familiar territory in, in the Florida Keys. One thing I wanted to talk about there, I, this is not a question you, this is a question I've been thinking about more than one anything that you've asked me, which is 
I'm sort of uh, uh, feel a little cramped, not just with Thorn, but with Florida. Although I, I still love Florida, I just feel like when I started in the 80s, uh, Florida was just being kind of just being discovered. Of course, Williford had written about Florida, John D mm -hmm. had written about Florida. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, but it was being discovered in a bigger way because of Miami Vice and, right, right. and, and basically because of the cocaine cowboys and all the stuff that was mm -hmm. in the news at that moment. Um, and I, and I kind of surfed that for a long time. I was, it, it benefited me, um, early in my career. And I wrote a certain kind of book about Thorne that was a little more, um, absurdist, a little more, uh, mm -hmm. comic, uh, yeah. about the kind of grotesque, weird characters that were. Uh, kind of the, uh, have now, I think, become Florida cliches. Um, the, I'm sorry? Florida man. The Florida man, yeah. And so now, now I feel like I want to write a book that's, that's not, that's set in Florida and is, ha is infused by Florida, but is, but is a novel, is a real novel, yeah, about more than just the kookiness of Florida. Um, mm -hmm. I just feel like that to me has become this subgenre that I felt um, somewhat trapped by. Mm -hmm. um, so even though uh, I, in answer to your question, I don't think I'm gonna go back with Harper, uh, but I'm trying to find a way to make, to broaden form. Yeah. So his interest is, is larger than just the, um, inhaling the beautiful fragrant breezes off that come off of the Atlantic all the time. And, right. you know, um, as much as I love to kind of lyrically try to capture that wonderful special feel of Florida. And you do. Uh, yeah. Well, thanks. But, you know, and I, and I will continue to do that. That's not, that's sort of my bailiwick, but um, I'm a, I feel a little hemmed in by the expectations that yes. other people have of a book that's set in Florida. It should be Carl Hyacin or it should be Tim Dorsey or it should be, you know, something that's a little goofier than I want to be anymore. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. As much as I like those guys and, and I think they're yeah. great at what they, they do. They do a great job of what they do. Yeah, absolutely. But I can see that that would be, you know, if, if that's not what you want to write, you know, um, if you want to do something different, I, I think there is that expectation of writers, of Florida writers, of people who write about Florida. You're, I, you know, um, yeah. but I think it's, but I think it's possible. To, yeah. Um, I think Brandy Wayne White doesn't do the wacky stuff. You know? Well, I mean, uh, his his buddy's a little bit that way. Yeah, he's yeah he's wacky, but that you know yeah. wacky but buddy. That's, that's, that's not okay. Florida. That's not just Florida, you know. Yeah, no, no, that's yeah. No, you're right. You're that's more what I'm talking about. Is you know, I I'm I like Randy, uh, and that's more the kind of book that's sort of not so. Actually, he's a lot more about Florida than I want to be. I what I'm talking about is being like this last book was. It was starting in Florida. It was Florida centric to a certain extent. But it was also a broader portrait mm -hmm. or broader landscape than yeah. just that. So yeah. I mean, that's what I'm. I'm. Yeah. That's my goal. Yeah. Well, I think that's. I think you've taken that a step toward that with this book because. Well, thank you. It does. You know, it does stretch beyond. You know, those kind of perimeters of Florida crime fiction. You know, it it stretches them in a number of ways, and um, and so. I, as I say, I think it's a step toward uh, something, doing something different. Well, that's what I'm trying to learn how to do. Yeah. And I think being, I think given that you're, that you're not writing these books under contract to a publisher also gives you a much freer reign, you know, yeah. that, because publishers love series, mis, you know, mystery series and and I know it's a double-edged sword. I've talked to a lot of writers about this, that, you know, it's great in that those checks keep coming in, 
but uh, after after you've written five or 10 or 20 books about one person, maybe you'd like to write something different and people yeah. feel boxed in and you, you know, as you said, you wanted to, you're out of that box, so. Yeah, it's uh, the part of the difficulty is uh, just the day-to-day -day, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph feel is, have I already written this before? Mm -hmm. Did I say these very same words before? Because you're, I'm so, uh, if I'm so restricted by character and place, mm -hmm. then it would be easy to just uh, parody myself. And I, mm -hmm. I'm trying, that's like the artistic death, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's the worst possible I, outcome. I have seen writers do that, not you, but yeah. I I have seen series books, you know, I, I've been reading them and thought, this sounds just like the one three books back, you know. I know, interchangeable. <laughs> I, don't in, I don't think it's intentional. I don't, I think yeah. it's the way you. Names we will not mention, but I know some very, very good writers mm -hmm. who I feel have fallen into that, that, mm -hmm. oh, you know, book 12 is a lot like book six, mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. know. Yeah. But, and it's, I think it's hard to, I think you have to be vigilant to avoid it if you're writing that kind of, you know, that kind of series. Sure, sure. Well, that's what I'm, that's my, one of my kind of artistic aesthetic struggles at the moment is to find a way to keep myself interested and alive artistically and not just, you know, oh, here he goes again, one more, crank out one more thing, just like the last one. Yeah. And you've written other, you've written poetry and you've written nonfiction. Are you doing anything like that or are you pretty much concentrating? Uh, no, no, I, you know, this, I, I'm working on a, a new Thorn book and, I, but I'm trying to make it as, as it stands right now. I'm not sure exactly what it's about because uh, I don't approach the books with a roadmap, yeah. but, um, or I probably should with uh, some <laughs> kind of outline probably save me a lot of time, but um, this is much more of uh, like a family uh, struggle or family mystery where Thorn is, it's not about murder yet. Uh, it doesn't start with anybody being in danger. Uh, it starts with uh, kind of some mysterious stranger who's come to town Mm -hmm. And who is this person? And yeah. and and Thorne is compelled to find out who this person is. And to me, that's a that's something I haven't done before. I'm mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, feeling my way about it, but yeah. you know, that to me is uh, plenty enough, uh, you know, creative uh, challenge mm -hmm. than to try to write anything else as well. I occasionally I write a blog post for my my website that's mm -hmm. as close to nonfiction as I have been getting lately. Um, but you know that's that, that's just sort of more like a diary keeping kind of right. writing than yeah. 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 Well I'm glad to hear you are working on another thorn and uh, I'll, I'll be very interested to see what form it takes. You know, it sounds like it's going to be different from the others in a lot. I of hope so. I'm, I'm, that's my goal. Yeah. Much as I love the others, but this sounds like an interesting, you know, new stage for him uh, to move into. And I'm just glad that character's back. I always liked him, you know. Uh, Frank, <laughs> I think he is. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I think he's met somebody as cranky as he is, which is it's a real challenge for him in this book. It's, the, he's, it's kind of his mirror image. Uh, yeah. He can, oh, can yeah. out-cranky him. Um, yeah. Yeah. It'll, it'll be, it's fun so far. Yeah, you've always sort of balanced him with Sugar, who is always, who is so, you know, cool and calm and... Yeah. Plays by the rules and, and Thorne is the monkey wrench and mm -hmm. Sherman is the straight and narrow guy. Yeah, I've always liked Sherman. I'm not sure what role he has in this new book. He hasn't actually appeared yet, uh, but he will. Um, yeah. Yeah. He serves an important function for Thorne because Thorne is, you know, off in the atmosphere and Sherman is a lot more grounded in the, mm -hmm. the realities of, you know, day-to-day -day modern life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. That'll, well, it'll be interesting to see that. 
Well, is there anything we haven't chatted about that you'd like to mention? No, I, you've, you've extracted a lot of stuff that I didn't even know I was interested in <laughs> or, or uh, that was on my mind. You know, that, that's, uh, I'd like to see this interview later. Maybe I can learn something about myself. Yeah. Well, it'll be <laughs> online. It'll be online. We're going to leave them online for about six months. So oh boy. You, can, you can watch it whenever you like. I'm telling people it's kind of like Netflix with authors, you know, <laughs> it's three minutes good. whenever you like. So, well, Jim, it's been great to talk to you. I, uh, I'm so glad to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, it has. But we, we will renew our contact, I'm sure, within the short time in the future. Yes. I hope forward so. to that day. Yes, I, I do too. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for talking about Bad Axe, which I really enjoyed. Thank and, you. And um, thanks to everyone who watched. And you can see all of our author interviews and panels at festivalofreading.com.